Great. Well, firstly, uh, kia ora. Good morning, everybody. It is so good to see you all here, and thank you for coming out on a sunny Auckland day to talk about tech. Uh, it is really a genuine pleasure to be back here at Future House uh, after the success of National's Tech Summit, uh, led by the great Judith Collins last year. It's great to be back here again. Uh, today we want to talk about National's proposals for boosting New Zealand's tech sector. Uh, as part of our bigger plan to work out how we grow this economy, how we rebuild it, and how we, in doing so we actually, that's how we bring down the cost of living crisis for everybody, and that's how we all ultimately get ahead. But before I go any further, can I just acknowledge Matt Rowe, um, who's the Executive Director at Outset Ventures, and say, Matt, thanks so much, mate, for having us here at your place at Future House here again today. Can I also acknowledge uh, Judith Collins, our spokesperson for science and technology and innovation, and say, Judith, thank you for all your passionate advocacy for the tech sector uh, over the last few years. You've been brilliant at just bringing this policy to life. It's also great to have our fantastic immigration spokesperson, our good friend Erica Stanford, that's with us here today. And also fantastic to have Mahesh Muralita here today, who is our candidate in Auckland Central, but is an incredibly successful startup entrepreneur and knows this space uh, incredibly well. So it's great to have you here with us, Mahesh, as well. Now, when you boil this whole election down, it comes down to one thing, and it's all about the economy. And on October the 14th, New Zealanders are going to get to choose who they think will be best placed to rebuild the economy and to end the cost of living crisis so that we can get ahead. And unfortunately, this week, what we have seen is more of the same. Uh, thank, thanks to Labor's six years in power, they have had economic mismanagement on a scale we haven't seen before. And sadly this week, Treasury confirmed that and said that after six years of Labor's economic mismanagement, sadly it's going to continue and continue to hit Kiwis in their back pockets. And their forecast showed some pretty alarming things. They showed a sustained economic slowdown with very anemic growth. They showed a high inflation, high interest rate environment that will be there for longer, uh, extending the cost of living crisis for everybody. And they showed most worryingly that our debt has exploded from $5 billion in 2019 to incredibly now being over $100 billion. And that means that we were having about $11 billion worth of debt servicing costs. And when you think about that, that's more than what we spend on all of our schools uh, in this country. And that is frankly bad news for every single New Zealander. And what's frustrating to all of us is that it just didn't have to be this way. But thanks to Labor's economic mismanagement it is, and we will do what we do always in the national governments, which is that we will clean up this financial mess uh, that Labor has left behind. But what are we going to do to get New Zealand out of recession, to get growth powering up? Uh, we have to be able to grow our economy. And that means that in government it's important to us that every sector and every business has to hustle, it has to look for opportunities, it has to seize them, and that of course includes the great tech sector. Now to rebuild the economy and to get it working for all New Zealanders, we need more innovation. We need faster growth in high value sectors like tech. The tech sector has, I think, almost limitless growth potential for high growth. And there's a lot of global competition for the brightest and smartest talent, as there is indeed for many industries. National understands that innovation and growth doesn't come from government per se, it comes from the hard work, the innovation, the risk-taking and the entrepreneurs in the private sector. But the government does have an, a really important role in partnering with the tech sector to create the policy and the regulatory environment that will allow that innovation and growth to occur. I've talked before about businesses and a future national government having an adult-to-adult -adult relationship so that we sit down together and we talk about what's needed from government to help sectors to be able to grow quickly and well. I now want to hand over to Judith and then also to Erica just to share a little bit more of the detail on our policies. Thank you, Judith. Thank you. Well, thank you, Christopher, and thank you very much for your support in tech. It's been great. Well, we need to grow the economy and productivity, and the way through is tech. Uh, when we consider our world-leading standards and primary products, we can thank the willingness of food producers to embrace science and tech. New Zealand has a great story to tell about our innovators and our drive to be the best in the world. And our harnessing biotech policy released earlier this year is an example of what is needed. Our tech founders and investors have told us that they need more talent and they need more international connections to help them into global markets. That's not just numbers of people, but the right people with the right skills and the right connections who can assist us to grow our technology economy faster and more effectively. So tech is everywhere in every industry, and according to Technology Investment Network, their TIN 200 group of technology companies, it is New Zealand's second biggest export earner, 
generating a record 11.49 billion, or 14 per cent of our exports last year. Now, our tech sector comprises 20,000 mostly small businesses, and some of them are here today. And together they employ over 114,000 people, and according to the sector, they expect to need another four to 5,000 new digital professionals each and every year into the future. So we are something of a start-up nation in New Zealand, and we need to become a scaled-up nation. We have enormous potential, and the sector has been asking me for a voice at the Cabinet table, and today we're announcing that a Christopher Luxon government will, be a, will have a Minister of Technology to be the, ca the champion of this increasingly important sector, and the Minister will work with the sector to ensure its voice is heard and its needs are met. And one of the needs for the sector is a rethinking of the treatment of employee share option plans, or ESOP, which are typically found in start-ups. Changes legislated in 2018 have worked against employees being able to confidently exercise their share options and are working against the need to retain skilled staff. That's why National is today undertaking to work with the tech sector and inland revenue to reverse the unintended consequences of the previous rule changes. This will bring us in line with Australia and also the US, and work will begin immediately following the election. I am confident too that our visa changes will help us to get the best people most needed into New Zealand and to assist with know-how transfer to our homegrown tech workers and assist Kiwi businesses to access, access crucial markets. And Erica and I have worked very closely on this. I'm going to ask Erica if she can run through the visa changes. Thank you, Erica. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Judith uh, and Chris, and thank you all for being here. Uh, as Judith and Christopher have said, if we want to grow our economy and lift incomes for all, we need to attract very highly skilled people to New Zealand. And it's clear that our current immigration system is somewhat rigid, not flexible, and not very innovative, uh, and we are not getting the skills that we need to power up uh, and scale up, as Judith has said. Even the Green List, which is supposed to target those highly skilled roles, uh, often falls short. Uh, we know in the last year we've only had about 51 people come across the border into New Zealand in some of those tech roles. We can do better and we can aim higher. In the global race uh, for talent, uh, New Zealand really is uh, still putting our shoes on. Today we are announcing three new innovative visas and we're going to try a few new things to try and target the world's top talent to come here and help us to scale up. Uh, so the first of those is the International Graduate Visa, capped at 500. Uh, it's a three-year open work visa for graduates of top 100 universities. They don't need a job offer. They can come here, they can live uh, and work for three years. Uh, we're after young, talented, highly educated, mobile people who have transferable skills to help us lift productivity and grow wages for all. Uh, we want New Zealand to be a top destination for young people, young, highly educated people, whether that's coming to start up their own company, work for a New Zealand startup, or work for an existing business. We want those people here. Uh, the second uh, visa is the Global Growth Tech Visa. This is the one I'm most excited about and have been working with Judith very closely on. Uh, this visa is firmly aimed at the world's top talent uh, in the tech sector. This uh, is a, very, a, a, a highly skilled visa. Uh, it is very limited and very attractive. You won't need a job offer. You can bring your family. It is a residency visa. It is a red carpet visa, very limited, very attractive, for the top, very top talent uh, in tech companies around the world. It will be open to anyone who has worked at a top 200 uh, global tech firm in a highly paid role with incredible skills and incredible contacts and the ability to help scale those top tech firms in New Zealand uh, and introduce them to the world. These people have a multiplier effect, we know that. We're only going to offer 250 limited places, but they will have an incredible impact on Kiwi tech firms. And then finally, the, globe, uh, the digital nomad visa. This visa is very innovative. Uh, mm. As we know, people are globally mobile uh, these days, and our immigration settings at the moment don't reflect that. A digital nomad visa that are common all over the world now. They allow highly skilled migrants the ability to live in New Zealand, and this visa will be for up to 12 months. Uh, you can bring your family and work remotely. 
But the key to this is we want those highly skilled, highly paid people who are working here remotely to stay. Uh, we want them to fall in love with New Zealand. We want them to see all the, work, the great work that's going on here and realise the opportunities that are here. But while they are here for those 12 months, we want them to travel. Yeah. Uh, we want them to put their kids uh, into school and pay international fees. Uh, uh, and we want them, as I say, eventually though, to stay here in New Zealand. These three visas are just about trying something new, about being a bit innovative mm. in uh, the immigration system, which we haven't seen over the last six years, about targeting very highly skilled uh, uh, young people to this country to help scale up our tech businesses. This is something different. We will take a look after 12 months and see how things are going and tweak them if we need to. Uh, but we haven't seen this in a really long time in the immigration service, something a bit different. Uh, about really targeting those people that we need. But this is all about young, skilled people that will help boost our, our economy and boost our, our productivity and get New Zealand back on track. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Well, listen, can I just say, um, firstly, thank you to both Judith and Erica for thinking through this policy. Thank you for the way that they've engaged with the sector, because a lot of the ideas have come from you that are here today uh, and have been engaged with both Judith and Erica on these issues. Uh, we have a fantastic country. We have an incredible country. And our vision is that we want to build one of the leading small advanced economies and countries of the world. And for that to happen, we have to become more prosperous. And that means that we've got to invest in a world-class education system. It means that we have to have modern, reliable infrastructure. It means that we have to embrace technology and innovation. And that's what this policy is about today. It's about how do we create that high-wage economy that we want to see emerge as becoming one of those uh, strong, small, leading economies of the world. So I want to say again thank you to both of you for the work that you've done. Thank you to all of you in the tech sector for engaging with us over the last two years as we've met with you many times and had lots of conversations. We know there's more work for us to do together. Uh, but as I've said before, uh, I want you to understand that government and business and community sector will actually work as in partnership together, uh, working through the challenges and the opportunities that we've got before us in this great country. So uh, thank you for all your support and help. And with that, uh, Erica and Judith and myself, have you taken any questions you may have? What Sorry, Craig. Sorry. Sorry. Oh, I think there'll be significant demand. I mean, New Zealand's an incredibly attractive place for people to come and, and, and to, to experience. Uh, but importantly, there's also a really um, a vibrant tech community that's here already in New Zealand. And I know from having lived overseas for 16 years and, and met with overseas folk who actually are very impressed by the capability that we have here in New Zealand. And what we're looking for is that we really want to get that transfer of global knowledge and talent and expertise to be partnering with our New Zealand firms so that they can, can upgrade their skills and actually then go out onto the global stage with some confidence as well. So you know, that's what we need, is we need to be able to get those connectivity points, those relationships, those connections, uh, that expertise and that talent to be coming along and partnering alongside the great talent that we have in our New Zealand firms. And in doing so, we build more productive firms that can go out into the world and, and sell great New Zealand products and services. The criticism would be that it's special treatment for the wealthy uh, I disagree completely. What we want is we want the world's best talent to be able to come here to New Zealand and partner with New Zealand's best talent and actually create opportunity for ourselves. You know, we are in this perverse situation where we have anemic and low growth forecasted for the next few years. Uh, we want to turn the volume up. We want, to, you know, we want this economy to really get moving and growing. And we have to deal with building a more productive economy. You know, one of the challenges that we've had is that we work incredibly hard in New Zealand. But actually, if we can access tech and we can actually uh, build that tech sector out, it's actually how we lift our wages and salaries, uh, as we've seen in other small advanced economies around the world. So that's, that's one of the great opportunities that we've got here. This, this is the top talent that you're looking to attract here. You're ideally looking at them sort of moving to New Zealand for more than six months, maybe up to 12 months, right? So they'll be paying tax here in New Zealand? Uh, yes, in some cases they will. It depends on different types of visas. So if you go through the three different visa types, um, there are some where the tax is paid overseas in their home country, uh, and there are others where it's paid here in New Zealand. But anyone who does pay tax here in New Zealand would be exempt from your foreign home buyers tax, yes? Uh, what I'd say to you is our foreign buyers tax is actually, as you well know... Uh, no, but because of our double tax agreement, so if you pay tax here in New Zealand, you cannot pay the, you, the foreign I'll let, buyers tax. I'll, I'll so let, I'll just, ju just because we've got three different types of visas, let me, let me uh, get Erica to talk to yeah, you about sure. it. Uh, in the first instance, the, uh, the top tech talent visa is a residency visa, mm -hmm. so they will be automatically allowed to buy houses. They won't be treated as a foreigner. Uh, the people that are coming here for a year are paying tax offshore, the, the, the digital nomads. 
um, it's, I mean, they might buy a house, um, they GST. might rent, um, and, and they'll be paying GST while they're here, of course. But then the third one is, is the work visa for the very young uh, people who are, have just graduated for, from those top universities, so unlikely that they'd be... But, any, but anyone who spends more than 183 days in the country in a 12-month period is considered a tax resident of New Zealand, yes, so they would be exempt from the foreign home buyer's tax. Well, this is exactly the same as any worker that comes into the country. But, but you the, see but my the people point, right, because then this further undermines the numbers that you're expecting to get from the foreign homes. No, not at all. No, no, I think no, no, it no. actually boosts them. It, it, it does, actually. <laughs> well, for a start, these numbers of these visas are very limited. It's 1,000 overall, so we're keeping that quite Capped. small and capping it to see how things go. Uh, and plus, the, the, uh, the tech visa is, has to be very red carpet and very specialised. We want to create demand for this for those top uh, people around the world. But that is a resident class visa and it's only limited to 250 people. Uh, and so they will have the ability to buy a house. They'll be treated very differently than foreign buyers. 1, 600 people to buy houses a year? Yeah, so let's just step it through because, uh, as I've said to you before, absolutely confident in our foreign buyer tax uh, numbers and the assumptions that we have behind that. As we said, before the, tax, uh, before the ban was put in place, it was 4,000 houses sold. Uh, we're, we're planning on about 16, 1,700 houses to be sold. That excludes the Australians and Singaporeans. It also puts a threshold in place. And that's happening at a time when we know that there's actually been suppressed demand because we've actually had a bright line test and we've also had a ban in place. And so actually to be able to, to, to open New Zealand up so that if you are a tech entrepreneur sitting in San Francisco, as I keep saying, who wants to spend six months of the year living there and living here in New Zealand, partnering with a local New Zealand tech firm, their ability to be able to buy a house, a luxury house, over $2 million, from a wealthy foreigner uh, who wants to come to New Zealand, paying a 15% tax, that most importantly, visa, that most importantly goes to lower middle-income workers. So, you know, that what I'm saying is here we have a situation where we have a tech sector that's doing a fantastic job here in New Zealand. I want it to be world class. I want it to be able to export all around the world. And for that to happen, we want to attract the best and the brightest to New Zealand. We've got three visa categories here that are actually designed to, to innovate and to actually see how this goes, to be able to get that influx of connections, people-to-people uh, -people connections, the trade cap capital and relationships that we desperately need. I guess, did you look at the uptake of these visas, which means that people would be, you know, residents here, so wouldn't be, part, um, wouldn't be subject to that tax. Did you factor that into your modelling? We have capped these numbers at quite low levels, but it's important, so it's important to us to understand the multiplier effect that when we actually can bring someone who's come from one of the top 100 universities, come from one of the top tech firms in the world, and we attract them and make it easy for them to be able to come to New Zealand, the contribution they can make, the multiplier effect that they can have with so many businesses here to actually help them scale up and to be able to have, go out into the world and export with great confidence is really critical. And so that's why I think the ideas that we've got are really innovative, but they're about driving more prosperity into the New Zealand economy, and that's got, exciting. Got All right, got question. Thank, thank you, Amelia. We've asked enough. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry. Thank you. Appreciate it, mate. Yes. 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 Yeah, now I'll let Judith talk to that. Yep. Right. Well, thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, we we believe that there is a, a great deal of good in Callaghan, and um, we've seen some great work coming out of them. We want to uh, have a look in government as to how we can get even better output. Um, we have not committed to the four hundred million dollar Gracefields project and the fifty million dollars, which seems to be the yearly. Um, uh, cost on that and we're very committed though to making sure that we get the best outcomes in science and innovation so look um, we've we've uh, we put Callahan in place it's mm. not that it's the fact that we think mm. innovation is crucial and can I just can I just can I just so can I just can I just add and close that conversation out um, what I'd say to you is that you know we have very good R&D capability here in New Zealand you know as you know we have great scientists we have great entrepreneurs uh, great innovators our real challenge in New Zealand has been that while we spend on average you know, the right sort of levels of money on research and development, it's actually been our inability to commercialise that technology that's been our challenge. And so that's what we're trying to do here is actually say, 
right, how do we actually commercialise our R&D capability so we can build great businesses, so we can employ more people at higher wages and salaries so they get more freedom and choice as to how they get to live their life. And I think the real opportunities in the R&D space, which Judith and I have observed, from looking at how other countries do it, other small advanced countries from around the world, is you know, we've got our institutes, we have our universities, we have our businesses, and sometimes they operate in silos from each other, and how do we actually get that join up happening so that we can actually uh, scale up that research and development and actually then go on and get it commercialised in that way. And so that's pretty exciting. Sorry, question at that. Um, as a founder of a great company, I want to thank you. This is a game changer. I really appreciate it, just having your voice at the table. The question that I have Correct. All of our team members have children in the company. How quickly do you anticipate changing the rules? And you know, are there any ways that we can expect that to happen? Is there any quick? Yeah. Look, we know how important that is. I'll let Judith talk to it in a minute. But just now, but um. What I just say to you, for those of you who, who may not be afraid with what happens in a tech company, is you're cash poor at the very beginning of a startup, and what happens is people issue equity and options, obviously, and that's what we're talking about here uh, as a means of remuneration. Judith, do you want to pass some yep. comment on that? Right, thank you, Chris, and um, thanks for that question. Yeah, so, and of course, uh, once people, the shareholders or the staff, want to exercise their options, they now get taxed on them at, um, as though they've actually got the money, which is really unhelpful yeah. when you are a um, a coder or something you're trying to, to get ahead. We think this needs to get sorted out very quickly. I think the unintended consequences, um, I can promise you that we will be working on this straight after the election. We're already working on it now, but we just need to make sure we get everything right and to work with, with IRD and also the sector. Very important we do that. I just yes. have some questions on other Sorry, issues sorry, sorry. Day. Yes, here you go. Oh, no, not at all. I think what we've seen at the Ministry of Pacific Peoples is um, what's concerning is actually a rather extravagant waste of taxpayers' money at a time of a cost of living crisis. But I think what's even more worryingly is that we've actually seen a politicisation of the public service where those events were being held to actually promote uh, you know, Labour, Labour caucus members, and I just think that's utterly unacceptable. So there's two major issues that we've got with it. One is, you know, why on earth would you be thinking of holding things that aren't critical to delivering and improving outcomes for Pacific people by having these breakfasts and at a time of a cost of living crisis where everyone's raining their belt in? But equally, the bigger issue is the politicisation of the public service. So it's, it's not, it's not Sorry. Um, I'm not sure. It's just it's, it's, what, it's just it's sort of the story that we've you know it's come out today. Yeah. And it's not Lynn said this morning that she was willing to put her job online in case the tax cut promise doesn't come through. Are you willing to do the same thing? We've made our, a series of commitments, Nicola and I. We've said there's eight commitments that we're making in a government. It's our pledge to the New Zealand people that we are going to rebuild the economy. I'm telling you, we are going to deliver tax relief to working New Zealanders. We think it's grossly unfair. So it's the unfairness in our tax system, isn't it? It's, I'm going to be committed to delivering tax relief to New Zealanders. I guarantee you we're going to do it. Uh, because, because, because actually low and, mid, low and middle income New Zealanders deserve tax break. And what's genius about this scheme is that we are reprioritising savings from within wasteful spending within this government. We are raising revenue, of which one piece of it is the foreign buyer tax. Uh, and we are actually going to make sure we deliver for New Zealanders and working New Zealanders. Because they deserve a tax break. Well, I'm, I'm, I don't know how to be any clear about it. I'm coming to government on October the 15th. Can we just, just let's take one at a time. Uh, so what we're saying very clearly is that I'm deeply committed to delivering tax relief for New Zealanders. They deserve a tax break. Well, I'm going to do it on October the 15th. Watch me. Can I just ask about planning work? So should those in emergency housing be charged 25% of their rent? And what should happen to those emergency housing workers who are not able to well, what we need to do is we need to be able to deliver social and state housing in this country. That means Kyanga Aura has to do its work, but we also need to capitalise community housing providers as well, and that's a big part of our plan. We're going to do a full review of Kyanga Aura once we're in government in terms of making sure the organisation is functioning correctly with respect to its procurement, its asset management and other practices. Uh, that's important to us. That, but Well, what I support is getting people out of emergency housing into safe, dry homes. That's what I support, is actually getting people to safe, dry homes. And I want to make sure we expand the amount of... 
I want, I want emergency housing. I want, we've got 3,500 families in emergency housing today, and we do not want them there. We want them in safe, dry, good homes. And that, for that to happen, we have to build more houses in this country, we have to open up our private rental market, and we have to expand our state and social housing offering. And one of the ways we do that is we power up our community housing providers by giving them capital uh, in order for them to be able to deliver on that as well. I've talked about that before. I haven't seen the detail of that particular report or analysis, um, but I'd like to have a look at that because that is, you know, we are we are very open for expanding uh, ETS. Yes. 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 Well, what we've said very clearly is that we want to have a six and a half percent reduction across the agencies How and government. Well, the way we do that is there's many CEOs of many government agencies. And if you just think about, for example, MB, you know, they've added two and a half thousand more public servants into the Ministry of, you know, of MB, uh, and they've actually increased their costs from $750 million to $1.25 million. So over six years, you've added half a billion dollars worth of cost, and you've also added two and a half thousand more people working there. And all we're saying across the piece is, on average, we want to deliver six and a half percent savings, and then we're going to target, task the CEOs to go through and say, let's stop this stupid project, project that we're working on that's not going anywhere. Uh, that will be determined ultimately by CEOs because there's actually a range of options for them in terms of how they may actually deliver those savings. And that's what happens in, you know, in, a, in, a, in a large organisation, that they can stop projects that aren't key or, or priority that are delivering and improving outcomes. They may decide not to actually fill or backfill vacant roles that exist today. Uh, and yes, there may be public, um, public service um, servants that, you know, that, that will be made redundant. But, but what Again, our approach is a different approach. Uh, I can't talk to the Act policy. What I can talk to so is... Well, what, what, is, what is going to be a significant number is 6.5% savings, and I'm going to task CEOs to deliver those goals uh, for us. And they can do it, as I said, in a, in a range of ways. Yes, yes sorry, last... Well, let me uh, get Erica to talk to you a bit more about that. Yeah, well, if you take a look at that, uh, the details of that policy, uh, the digital nomad policy is actually very targeted mm. at people who uh, earn at least $250,000 or $240,000. So what we're looking for is highly mobile uh, people who are at the, at the top of their game who are going to come here and st uh, potentially put their children into, into schools and pay international fees. Uh, and do some of the amazing adventure tourism and spend time here. So, but then the key, the next step, mm. is to make sure that they stay here. So it's not just for everybody. Yeah, well, one of the things we don't do very well at Immigration New Zealand is actually follow up on these. So, what, and we didn't do it very well uh, with, with other investment visas. We want to do it with these visas. So immigration has the right and the ability to actually uh, survey these people and ask them questions while they're here on those visas. And I would envisage that we would do exactly that to make sure we can see uh, you know, exactly what they're doing. Uh, and we can see when they transfer their visas. So we know for a digital nomad, for example, we'll be able to see if they turn that into a work visa or a residency visa. But, but collecting really good information about what these people are doing mm. uh, and where they're going and where they're investing uh, is really important and we haven't done that in the last six years.